The body of a 23-year-old female has been found underneath the floorboards of a church. You don't know what's happened. This is your one shot. At this point, your body is your crime scene. A killer is at large, and fear spreads across the country. What else has this man done? There is a killer on the loose. There is a threat to the public. The clues are in the crime scene, where the forensic evidence will be crucial for the police to catch the killer. Twenty-three-year-old Polish student Angelika Kluk has been reported missing in Glasgow. She was last seen in the grounds of the church where she lived and worked. She's five three with long fair hair and green eyes. Last seen wearing a pink vest top and black trousers. In all missing person cases, you are looking for the positive result, and you want to share that with the family. Angelika's family are becoming increasingly concerned and asked her to please get in touch. Police around St. Patrick's Church, the chapel where much-loved student Angelica Kluke has been staying. She was working here to raise money for her studies. Angelica eventually got a room in the chapel house, so she lived kind of on site and helped out around the parish. Angelica was probably a, what we'd class a vulnerable person. She was basically living alone. A religious young girl, she comes here to enjoy the city to enjoy her religion and to continue her studies. She was settled here, she felt happy here, she felt secure. It was a home from home for her. Police are searching the grounds of St Patrick's Church in Glasgow, where Angelica had been staying. Looking at where Angelica stayed, start your search there to see what you can find. None of her belongings had been touched, passports hadn't been taken, which begins to heighten your tensions. This is a big marker that perhaps something nefarious has happened. A steady stream of detectives and forensic experts arrived at St Patrick's Church. As suspicions continue to grow, the police call in the specialist forensic search team. Now these are people who come in who will literally leave no stone unturned. They will lift floorboards, they will go into lofts, they will strip down things to search the premises and in particular they search the church. My strong memory is of getting a call from the police to say that I needed to get here quickly. There was a major development. Search officers have noticed a misaligned carpet tile in the chapel. By lifting the carpet, they reveal a small hatch where they discover the body of a young woman underneath the floorboards. The local community are in a state of shock as the body of a young girl was discovered here last night. Her body is still there, awaiting forensic tests. Five days after she was reported missing, police have found Angelica and a murder investigation is launched. I've never been to an incident in a chapel before or a church. There are people round about who are desperately keen to find out what's going on, which showed concern. So on arrival, it was quite daunting. Elliot McKenzie is one of the first officers on the scene. This is a totally bizarre scene, certainly most alien to me and to my colleagues. Crime scene expert Sarah Thurkle has over 25 years' experience in the field. In this case, the body was found under floorboards in a church. This is an absolute forensic nightmare because it's impossible to get the body out. So there has to be a plan as to how the scene's going to be approached and what measures we're going to take to try and recover the maximum forensic evidence from the deceased. Forensic scientist Carol Rogers was assigned to the case. Angelica was lying directly underneath the hatch and there was green tarpaulin on top of her and also a black bin bag. So what you could see was basically from Angelica's waist to her knees. The way she was lying underneath the hatch, her legs were bent double underneath her. With something like this, you've got a body 
you don't know what's happened, you don't actually know where they've been murdered, you don't know if they've just been dumped here. So you're looking to recover a lot of samples because this is your one shot. At this point, your body is your crime scene. Quite clearly, this was going to be a meticulous forensic harvest and it was going to obviously take a long time. And this was the golden opportunity to connect Angelica's death to the perpetrator. The hatch measures approximately 70 centimetres by 50 centimetres. Access to the body is going to be extremely difficult. Carol and the team plan their forensic strategy. You only have one shot at a crime scene, so you need to make sure that you take it in slow time and you work out the best plan of attack, if you like, before you, you go in there and start recovering the evidence. So the main difficulty really is that the body's underground. It's a really small space, so there has to be a really good strategy as to where the body's going to be examined, what evidence is going to be taken off her in situ. I wanted to go down and examine Angelica's body. Where it was is as soon as you move a body, then you can redistribute body fluids and can also potentially contaminate any evidence. The best way to do this is to go down underneath the floorboard and take the body samples. However, standing at the edge of the hatch and looking down, and it's dark and it's tiny, and the thoughts going through my head were, it's definitely the first time I'd been at a crime scene under the floorboard and the first time I'd been at a crime scene at a church. I, I was scared, I was, I was really scared about going down there and doing it. The CSIs will have to go to unprecedented lengths to harvest the crime scene. We hooked up a light underneath the hatch so we could actually at least see what we were doing. And then we used what we call a tread plate, which is a piece of metal about 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres. Carol carefully lowers herself into the crime scene, ensuring she does not disturb the body. It was. It was really claustrophobic. It was about three or four feet in height, so I was crouched down. So there was lots of space behind me, but very limited space to either side or above me. Once I'd started to examine Angelica's body, it becomes something different. It becomes about her and just this beautiful young girl with everything ahead of her and now you're sitting there next to her. You're starting to uncover a picture of what's happened to her and all you want to do is your absolute best because you want to make sure you get that evidence. Carol examines the bin bag on top of the body. It smelt very strongly of blood decomposing body matter and we were concerned that there was perhaps some more flesh or another victim chopped up in this bag and that black bag was emptied out and that contained items of very, very heavily bloodstained clothing, a knife, a little block of wood. It's really quite unusual for these items to be left so close to where the body is. Normally a killer would discard these items a long way from the scene where it's unlikely they're gonna be found. So this is a real breakthrough. Inside the bin bag was a knife. This knife was examined and there was no obvious blood on the knife. Inside there was some clothing, but also a sheet with some green paint on. The sheet was stuck together in the black bin bag, which means that this would have been put in when it was wet. So from a forensic perspective, this evidence was examined and then recorded and then packaged and for fast track actions there that can be taken. The black bin bag was fingerprinted this was to be loaded onto the fingerprint database to try and ascertain if it linked to any offenders at all. In the dark and cramped conditions, Carol begins to take samples from Angelica's body. Once we'd removed the tarpaulin and the bin bag, we could see Angelica's body. We could see the extent of her injuries. We could see her clothing was in a bit more disarray. We could see what looked like stab cuts to her chest and there was a lot of blood staining around. Of course it affects you, of course it does. You, know, you don't become hardened to it. It was clear she died in a frenzied, very violent attack. There had been efforts to tie her hands and to gag her. It was a very challenging scene. I think when you have a deceased female 
it always goes through your mind, could this be sexually motivated? Although she was fully clothed, it was very apparent that the fly of her trousers were undone. These things start to make you think, yeah, potentially this could be sexually motivated. And so it's really important for us to take these intimate samples from the victim with the chance that we may be able to find DNA in the form of seminal fluid. These samples must be taken in situ if possible, um, because obviously any movement of the body may destroy or we may lose this kind of evidence. After more than three hours of intense forensic recovery, the samples are rushed to the lab for DNA profiling. Regardless of what the crime is, there's a victim and it's affecting someone badly. You appreciate the urgency because especially with a case like Angelica, at that point you're very aware there is someone out there who is a rapist and is a violent murderer. The onus is on yourselves and the police to make sure this person is apprehended as quickly as possible so that no one else is going to, to be a victim. With a killer on the loose, the CSIs must act fast. The body of 23-year-old Polish student Angelika Kluk has been discovered beneath the floorboards of St. Patrick's Church in Glasgow. She'd been working at the church and residing in the chapel house next door. CSIs have taken intimate samples and forensic tests are being carried out on the blood-stained clothing, piece of wood and knife that were found in a bin bag on top of the body. This should have been a day of worship here at St Patrick's Church, but instead the building remains a crime scene, sealed off and guarded by police. Angelica's death has now been treated as murder. All I can say it was it was a horrific and very, very violent attack on a young lady. Parishioners are left in shock after hearing the news of Angelica Kluke's brutal murder. Here was someone, a young girl, being killed in this church that everybody in Glasgow knew because it's so visible, uh, it just defied belief. The people in this community felt the pain in a particular way because this is part of their life. This is where they brought their children. This is where they got married. It is pregnant with emotion, this building. It's not just a church, it's an extension of their own homes. The post-mortem of Angelica's body has been conducted and the pathologist can confirm the cause of death. Angelica had severe head injuries, blunt force trauma to the head from small pieces of wood had been found in Angelica's head wound, as well as multiple stab wounds, and I believe she had some injuries to her hands and her arms as well. More horrific details emerge. Angelica's mouth had been gagged with yellow insulation tape. This was heavily bloodstained with blood from the victim, so therefore it was going to be quite difficult to get any of the perpetrator's DNA because most of the DNA is going to be masked by the victim's DNA. The tape was wrapped a number of times around the victim's mouth and head. They would have cut the insulation tape off from around the victim's mouth and then slowly and painstakingly tried to split the layers apart in order that they will be able to chemically treat it and then maybe some dye to be able to enhance any fingerprints on there. So one of the lower layers of tapes revealed a partial fingerprint which was loaded onto the fingerprint database but it was too partial to be able to come up with any suspects on the database. This partial fingerprint was swabbed for DNA. The police continue to search the church grounds to ascertain where the murder occurred. The priority at this point for the police is to try and establish where has Angelica been murdered? We know she's been dumped underneath the floorboard, but where has the actual assault happened? Reports suggest Angelica was last seen in the church garage. Carol prioritises this location. We started looking at all the items in the garage. The garage is full of pots of paint, bits of furniture. On first inspection, we didn't see anything obvious. Carol takes a closer look, and something catches her eye. The garage was a dark grey concrete floor, so we got down and looked. I thought, well, that looks like a spot of blood was circled it, and then, oh, there's another one. And we just started circling spots of blood, and 
the more you circle, the more you started to see. And then after a few minutes, you stand up and look, and you just have all these circles all over the floor. The small spots were discovered on the floor, walls, and ceiling. Carol quickly identifies the distribution pattern, akin to impact blood spatter. And it's a kind of blood staining you see when someone has been struck or kicked or punched, when someone's been assaulted. So cast off blood staining occurs when someone is repeatedly struck with a weapon. And as you imagine, the more someone is struck, the more the weapon becomes stained with blood. And every time that weapon is swung, blood will cast off the weapon onto the surrounding area, uh, usually the ceiling or the walls. If it's cast off onto the ceiling, that's an indication that the weapon being used is something that's quite long. Within the garage, there were spots of blood which were sampled and then checked against the deceased's to see if it was her blood. This came up as a match. The forensic scientist was confident to say the garage appears to have been the site of the attack, the initial attack on Angelica and where she was potentially murdered. Forensic officers continue to work on connecting the two key scenes within the church. The garage has an internal door into the church so you can move from the garage right into the church without ever going outside. But it was a case of getting searching all the area of flooring between the garage door and the hatch door. It's very difficult to move a dead body. They're incredibly heavy. This corridor area would have been searched by the CSIs for any evidence linking the two scenes together for any fibre work, for any blood transfer, any other DNA samples along this route. A meticulous search of the route from the garage to the hatch fails to provide any new leads. We never ever found a trace, so we're of the belief Angelica was transported between the garage and the hatch, wrapped in the tarpaulin. The police turn their attention to the people who have recently been in contact with Angelica. The police would then go round these people, they would ask about her movements, they would ask about her background, her lifestyle. So there's a whole process that gradually builds up this increasingly detailed picture of everyone connected with Angelica running up to her death because she may have been in contact with her killer before she went missing. In the very early days of the inquiry, four names that were of particular interest to the police. Of these four people, the police were able to speak quite quickly to three of them. The person they couldn't speak to was a man called Pat McLaughlin, who was a handyman at the church. The last sighting of Angelica had been constructing a garden shed in the grounds of the church here along with a handyman who had also been residing or helping out at the church. They had his name. There had been efforts to trace this handyman, but um, unfortunately to no avail. And this person, Pat McLaughlin, had been working here. He came to the priest and sort of offered his services just as a kind of extra pair of hands and he had apparently a very winning way and an engaging manner appearing to be a very generous guy down in his luck. As concern spreads amongst the community, forensics get the results from the intimate swabs taken from the deceased. We established there was a lot of semen on the intimate swabs and we obtained DNA profiles to interrogate the national DNA database. We obtained a match for a person held under the name of Peter Tobin. Unexpectedly, the police now have another name in the frame. So what began as, a, as an unusual case uh, was then transformed into an exceptional case when the police found that Peter Tobin was actually an alias for a man called Pat McLaughlin. He would then have become the prime suspect in this case. To find out that a suspect is using an alias, this shows that the suspect is confident in using another identity and able to move under the radar. Unfortunately for police, this means that Tobin could now be anywhere and it further complicates the effort to find him. As the search for Tobin is underway, 
more test results come in. Inside the bin bag was a knife. This knife was examined initially, and there was no obvious blood. And on closer inspection, there was a small trace of DNA between the blade and the handle. I would have suspected that the offender has wiped the knife, but not wiped it enough to remove all the DNA. And this came up as a full DNA profile for Angelica. The prints extracted from the bin bag were a match to the prime suspect, Peter Tobin. So now we have fingerprints on the bin bag of Peter Tobin and then a knife within that bin bag that's got Angelica's DNA on it. So the case now is building against Peter Tobin. Tests carried out on the block of wood did not provide any new leads. This block of wood was examined and then packaged for any future links to any other scenes or indeed to the murder of Angelica. The DNA swab from the fingerprint on the underside of the yellow insulation tape has also matched the prime suspect. Peter Tobin's DNA was actually embedded on an undersurface of the tape would indicate that he'd been the person that unrolled the tape when it was applied to Angelica's face. Detectives analysed Tobin's criminal record, which further indicates he is the man they're after. He had raped two young girls, left them tied up in a flat to die, and luckily one of them escaped and raised the alarm. In 1994, Peter Tobin had a conviction for raping a 14-year-old girl and sexually assaulting another. Whilst looking after Tobin's son, the two young schoolgirls were apparently drugged with an antidepressant. The police have launched a national manhunt and turned to the public for support. Mr Tobin is considered a potential risk to members of the public. Any person who sees this man is advised not to approach him He's now at large in the general population in the UK and they want to find him as soon as possible and to protect the public. The hunt for Tobin intensifies and the forensic scientists continue to search for more incriminating evidence. If there's a killer on the loose, we won't stop until we catch them. Serial sex offender Peter Tobin is on the run. He is suspected of murdering 23-year-old Polish student Angelika Kluk. A national manhunt is launched. What would have become quite quickly clear to detectives is the kind of offender Tobin is. He is a mobile, violent sex offender. They tend to be quite determined people. Their crimes are difficult to detect because they're mobile and, in this instance, because Tobin is using an alias. What else has this man done? Are there other crimes in Glasgow or elsewhere that this man has been involved in? A warning to the public, Mr Tobin may be a potential risk. The police turn to the press to help locate Tobin. The media can be used to communicate to the public about this person because he's dangerous. A request from the police for any members of the public who either had encountered this man or knew of him to come forward as witnesses and to aid the inquiry. If anyone sees him, please alert your local police immediately. Forensic evidence links Tobin to the victim and the deposition site, and the detectives believe Angelica was murdered in the garage. Despite a number of stab wounds, the pathologist has declared the cause of death as blunt force trauma to the head. The CSIs continue to search the grounds of the church for the murder weapon. It's incredibly busy. You're processing the crime scene and you're processing samples at the laboratory. Police at this stage trying to track down Peter Tobin. The extensive searches unearth a pair of men's blood-stained jeans and a wooden table leg. Both are fast-tracked to the test lab. As the investigation progresses, these table legs were examined by a forensic scientist for any traces of blood. And a small amount of blood was found on one of the table legs. Interestingly, on the table leg that had the small piece of wood missing, matched up the wood that was found in the bin bag as a physical fit between one of the table legs that was found in the garden. So at this point, everything fits together to indicate that this has been the weapon that has been used to, to strike her. Police are confident that they finally have the murder weapon. But it only has traces to the victim. They still need more evidence that ties Tobin to the murder. 
forensic scientists examined this have found quite a heavily blood-stained area on the knee of the jeans. And this blood linked back to our victim. It's important then to try and look for wearer DNA on the jeans. The areas that would be looked at for wearer DNA would be around the waistband of the jeans and maybe the, uh, the zip or fly area of the jeans. A DNA profile was obtained from one of these areas, which matched back to Peter Tobin. Apart from the semen, the jeans were the first item that linked Peter Tobin to Angelica Kluck, but you could never say when that DNA was deposited. So all we could say was, in our opinion, the wearer of the jeans had been involved in an assault. Peter Tobin had worn those jeans at some point. So you're building up a picture. The forensic evidence is mounting, and the police press appeal has provided a new lead. 400 miles south of the crime scene, a nurse at a London hospital believes that a Scottish patient named James Kelly resembles their prime suspect. Since studying the killer's profile, they know that he is confident changing his identity and confident to move to another location. So essentially, it's not beyond his MO to be using a new name in a new place. The Metropolitan Police descend on the hospital ward, where they detain James Kelly, who is indeed Peter Tobin. They finally have their man. A man has been arrested and held in connection with the murder of young student, Angelica Cloak. It's a bit of a relief for the family, more than anything, because you know now that there is going to be an investigation. You have a person in custody. When an offender is arrested and taken into custody, clothing will be seized. We would take hair combings from the suspect for any potential trace evidence. If someone's been arrested for sexual offence, penile swabs and sexual swabs would be taken from them, and also all items of jewellery would be taken. The more traces that link Tobin to Angelica, the stronger the case against him becomes. The clothes he is arrested in are sent away for tests. He was wearing a watch at the time. Again, this is an area that's very difficult for an offender to completely clean. It was a metal sort of link bracelet on the watch and we found a trace amount of blood. Within those links and that matched Angelica Kluck's profile. So this is again a, a crucial bit of evidence taken from the suspect when he's in custody. Police now have another piece of vital evidence which links the suspect to the victim. His T-shirt was seized whilst he was in custody and there was some staining on the front of the T-shirt. That was examined and on the lower front of the T-shirt we found semen staining. And that matched Peter Tobin. It was mixed in with a lot of female DNA and that matched Angelica Kluck. So it seems that that was perhaps a T-shirt that he wore when he had sexual intercourse with Angelica. At this point, they have a man in custody who has changed his identity, who has moved to another area of the UK, but who is still wearing the same T-shirt that he was wearing when the act took place. It may act as a trophy, as a reward, as a sign of accomplishment, or it may be that he wanted to stay in the mindset of when the crime took place. In custody, Tobin denies any involvement, but with the overwhelming forensic evidence against him, he is charged and sent to the High Court in Edinburgh. When you have an innocent victim, a totally innocent victim, a vulnerable victim, that hits home. CSI's recovered DNA from the crime scene of Peter Tobin, a convicted sex offender. Detectives discovered that he had been using a false identity while working at the church as a handyman. So they will have really very strong evidence to connect Tobin with this crime. 
they will know where the attack started because of the blood spatter in the garage. They've got fingerprints from Tobin on the materials that were used to wrap up Angelica's body to contrast their evidence with his account. The evidence that probably creates the strongest timeline is the evidence for the intimate swabs. Because there was so much semen on the intimate swabs, it's what we'd expect if someone had had intercourse recently. So at this point, our opinion is whoever has had intercourse with Angelica is the person who is responsible for her death. The family of Catholic student Angelica Kluke has been put through more pain today. Her character was called into question in front of the jury. Tobin's defence team claim Angelica had a consensual relationship with him and that the evidence was circumstantial. I felt really sorry for Angelica's family when I saw the headlines and a lot of the headlines seemed to be trying to paint her as a certain kind of person and her name was dragged through the mud and it was, it was just disgusting. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon for any sexual or non-sexual interactions between the offender and the victim to be brought up at the trial, even though it may be of minimal relevance, and this undermines the crime itself. And that was really hard. She was just a young girl trying to better herself. She was studying. She was living and working in a church. It, it just didn't make sense, but it was all to try and paint a picture to help the defence. As the trial commences, the authorities continue to investigate Tobin's past. The way in which Tobin goes about carrying out his acts of crime and the planned nature, including uses of alias and traveling long distances to evade capture, it indicates that he may have done this before. So he's particularly skilled and experienced in carrying out this sort of action. Well, in 1993, he, he left two schoolgirls pretty much for dead. And then in 2006, has been accused of a murder. And that this has taken place over a period of around 15 years. It's difficult to believe that there hasn't been any criminal activity in between those particular offences. And that there are other cases that may be undetected. And that led to the development of a, a UK-wide operation involving numerous police forces that was called Operation Anagram. Senior police officers from all 43 British police forces asking them to look again at outstanding missing persons, rape and murder cases and check against Tobin's movements. And the police are now beginning to form a view or at least a strong suspicion that this man could be a, a serial killer. Peter Tobin is standing trial for the murder of 23-year-old Polish student and church worker, Angelika Kluke. As the trial continues, the authorities investigate Tobin's past, as they believe he may have committed more offences than are known. She was found underneath the floorboards of the church after being missing for five days. Peter Tobin, a convicted sex offender, was using a false identity. Forensic scientist Carol Rogers is about to take the stand. To be honest, when I stood in the witness box, I always make a big effort not to look at the accused. But in this instance, I did. And I think my initial thoughts were, he just looked like this small, frail man. He looked like he didn't seem like the kind of person you'd expect to look like to be carrying out that crime, if that makes sense. As Angelica's family endure a long and emotional trial, the police are still investigating Peter Tobin's history and whether he may have killed more victims. The police had formed the view that Peter Tobin was an experienced killer. The move from a single homicide inquiry to a serial homicide inquiry that is UK wide is one of huge magnitude involving far more resources and skills and organisations to get to the bottom of it. And he's, he's definitely a serial offender and possibly a serial killer. Operation Anagram quickly collates a timeline of Tobin's past addresses and compares it with the missing person's database. Research shows that most serial killers have an ideal target in mind. They are selected for a reason. It may be opportunity, 
access to sexual activity or a lack of threat posed by the victim. Tobin appeared to target young women who did not present a threat to him. By looking at Tobin's previous crimes, investigators have the opportunity to scrutinise the details and see if the details of the previous crimes can help them to move the investigation forward. The investigation soon identifies two unsolved cases that coincide with Tobin's geographic history. One was the 15-year-old girl, Vicky Hamilton, who went missing from the Falkirk area in 1991. It was in February, after a weekend at her sister's, that the schoolgirl appeared to vanish. And the second in the same year, a few months apart, was the teenager Dinah McNichol, who went missing travelling back from a music festival in Hampshire to her home in Essex. Tobin was living near those locations around the time that the girls went missing. Despite the fact that it was many years later, they still had the belief that there might be some evidence that could be found. A specialist forensic team meticulously searched Tobin's former home in Bathgate, which was just a mile away from where Vicky Hamilton was last seen. I never knew anything really about Peter Tobin, and I started getting the details through. Peter Folding is a forensic search specialist. So Operation Anagram was the main inquiry into Peter Tobin, but highly secretive operation. And then we were given the task of searching the complete house from top to bottom. And I'm thinking this is a huge operation. We couldn't leave it one stone unturned. The loft all the way down through each room, the gardens, the chimneys, everything. We were looking for the body of Vicky Hamilton. We believed that she was there. In Edinburgh, the trial is still in the balance as Carol gives evidence from the witness box. Up until that point, the whole investigation is a team. But when you go to give evidence, it's suddenly the focus is on you. It's something that you're trained for, but you can never fully prepare for until you're actually standing there. That witness box can be an incredibly lonely place because suddenly it's up to you to get everything across to the jury and your evidence is going to be scrutinised. In this case, the forensic science was crucial and helped reconstruct where the attack had taken place and what had then happened afterwards. But I'd be lying if I didn't say I was sitting there anxiously awaiting the verdict. Whilst the jury deliberates, the specialist search team in Bathgate make a significant discovery. We were there five or six days searching. It was a long days working in the loft by stripping out all the lagging, and that was quite a time-consuming job. And then while searching behind the rafters in the loft at one end, they found a dagger, and it was immediately put into a forensic tube. It was sent off for DNA analysis. Whilst police await the DNA results from the discovery at Bathgate, the jury at the Edinburgh trial have reached their verdict. Unlike other cases, the forensic science evidence in this case was crucial and enabled the conviction of the killer, Peter Tobin. Peter Tobin is found guilty for the murder of Angelica Kluke. He is sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 years. Today, the judge told the 62-year-old he was unfit to live in human society. It's a big relief. It's a big relief because, as impartial as you are, you feel that that is completely and utterly the right result. The family now have an answer. But at the closure of the public case, that was not the end. But as we know, there was some real suspicions about the nature of Peter Tobin. Within weeks of Tobin's conviction, the forensics find a positive DNA match from the knife found in Bathgate. If there's DNA in an item, it can last an indefinite length of time. So, for example, if DNA has been found on a knife and the knife has been put away in a cupboard, unless an item has been washed or cleaned or used subsequently, the DNA can stay on there indefinitely. Cold case investigations around the world uh, rely on this crucial uh, DNA evidence. Tobin is arrested in prison and interviewed regarding the disappearance of Vicky Hamilton. Is there any way that you can assist us in finding 
this girl now? Well, we don't know. Sorry, I can't help you. You know what I mean, man? As I say, I've never met her. You know what I mean? I've never, ever. You have no knowledge of where? No. Tobin's manner and body language appears to be quite aggressive, angry. Serious offenders often have troubled and dysfunctional experiences in their childhood. This reflects in Tobin's history. So at age seven, he went to a reform school. He also spent time in a young offenders institution. And later on, he was convicted for burglary, forgery, and a number of other crimes. Research shows that those who have an early age of onset for offending are more likely to continue their offending into adulthood and those crimes may become more serious as time goes on. It is likely that his offending would have started earlier in his 20s, so there may be a number of other crimes that are currently undiscovered. Under the eyes of the media, the search team descend on another of Tobin's previous addresses, this time in Margate, Kent. Today, experts are searching for more victims of the recently convicted killer, Peter Tobin. To search for disturbed soil or human remains that have been buried in concrete, we use a thing called GPR, ground penetrating radar or magnetometry, and that will send a signal, radar signal through the ground. It sends a return back to a computer and it gives me an image on the screen. Forensic experts are focusing on this area at the back of Tobin's former garden. Ground penetrating radar has highlighted this area, which means that several feet below, this soil was once disturbed. There was a large area where the ground had been disturbed. It was a really deep hole. The forensic archaeologist to actually dig that down, and that's a painstaking job. It's a slow task, hoping that they would find human remains the search team make a gruesome discovery. An enormous amount of work, a detailed excavation of the garden, but what it did do was it led to them to the discovery of the bodies. Work on the site stands still today. Detectives arrive on behalf of Vicky Hamilton's family to lay flowers on the ground where her body has been discovered. Well, Dinah McNichol had been missing for 16 years before her body was found here, buried in the back garden of what was Peter Tobin's Margate home. She had been bound, gagged and buried here alongside Vicky Hamilton. He clearly was an extremely violent man. His MO was burying bodies. That was the way Tobin operated. Over the years, him working as a handyman, etc., or travelling salesman, roaming the country, there's probably many more he's disposed of, and no one will ever know. 16 years after the disappearance of Vicky Hamilton and Dinah McNichol, Tobin faces two further trials, where he is found guilty of both murders and receives two more life sentences. Serial killer Peter Tobin will never be released. It's the end of an investigation, it's the end of a, a court hearing. It's not the end for the family and friends and community of Angelica. Vicky Hamilton and Dinah McNichol. But what is left behind is a family, a family who've lost a loved one and a vacuum in their lives. It's probably the biggest case of my career, something that was a privilege to be part of, also something that incredibly tragic. I guess there's a bit of an anger because my gut feeling is there's more and we'll never ever get to the bottom of that. We came face to face in a hugely uncomfortable way to the depths of evil. But at the same time, looking back all these years, evil didn't win the day that Peter Tobin killed Angelica Kluke. It did lead to the capture of one of Scotland's most dangerous, most evil criminals and his incarceration for the rest of his life. Discover a free living off-grid community in the Californian desert as we join Ben Fogel exploring the lost city brand new tomorrow at nine. And tonight, from road traffic collisions to a cardiac arrest, trauma teams are racing to the scene in ambulance code red next. <laughs>